Okay, so by my clock, we're on the top of the hour. Um, so we best start this proceedings and get everything rolling. So we do appreciate everybody joining us on time. Um, we certainly appreciate your attention and you taking time out of your day to join us today for this special end of the year session. This one is a little bit different to what we might normally do. It's our final webinar of the year from Sutron Global. Um, and it's a sponsored educational session purpose of which is really just to give back, I suppose, at the end of the year um, and to hopefully help you uh, in respect of some continuing personal professional development, something that might give you a competitive edge in 2020. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce this session. My name is Michael Hughes. I'm the Senior Account Manager at Sutron Global. Um, before we get too far into the session, um, just a very couple, uh, a couple of very minor housekeeping issues for you. Um, we are delivering this session to you today via GoToWebinar. So to a certain extent, we're at the mercy of that technology, which is normally very, very good. Um, but in the event of any audio or visual issues, please just let us know via the chat box and we'll do our very best to address those in a timely fashion for you. For the quality of the audio, the lines will be muted throughout, um, but there is a facility for you to ask questions of our guest speaker at any point. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end. So there's a questions uh, facility on the GoToWebinar interface in front of you, uh, as there is also a chat facility. So you can make use of whichever of those is easier for you. Uh, if we can perhaps just go to the next slide, please. Provider, we are a provider, I should say, of uh, primarily an ILS and a discovery platform. The discovery platform was new in 2019. Um, so if anybody would like any further information on any of our uh, solutions, any of our services, um, there'll be contact information available for you that you can see now on the next slide. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to us for any uh, information in relation to the solutions that we provide or in addition uh, to anything that you may think of about this particular session after the fact, then we'll be very happy to address any of that for you. But it's my pleasure now to introduce you to our guest speaker today, Richard Halser. Uh, Richard is a, is a well-respected ind independent industry consultant. Um, very active within the SLA environment and the community, um, an active blogger, um, as you can be able to perhaps see from the, the link there, cybrarianviews.com. I encourage everyone to go take a look at that. Richard's going to talk to us today on the, on the subject you've all been sent information about, and the purpose really is to how you can might be able to apply this in your own day to day. And as I mentioned earlier, perhaps give yourselves a competitive advantage uh, in 2020. So without too much further ado, uh, Richard, thank you for joining us and I'll hand the floor over to you from this point. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, and you can hear me, right? Just making sure. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, great. Um, all right. Uh, so thank you for uh, participating in uh, today's webinar. Uh, just a little bit more background on me. Uh, I've worked uh, in the academic environment, in the corporate environment, uh, in many capacities. I've worked for biotech companies. I've worked for computer companies. Uh, I more recently worked in the cultural institution environment in museums, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, now I do independent consulting, but what I'm going to talk to you about is a project uh, proof of concept uh, that I, I uh, led as part of many things I was doing, uh, running the library and archives uh, for the Natural History Museum in the Los Angeles County area. And what you see before you is, these are all mainly my pictures, so their copyright is mine. Uh, and uh, so uh, these um, are uh, dinosaurs in one of their exhibits to give you a idea of the environment. And I know a lot of you are from the corporate environment or academic environment. And I want you, as I'm going through this, um, think about what I'm talking about for your environment. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to talk about the project as we did in museums, but you will hear me relate it to uh, academia and also corporate as well. So um, hopefully the principles that are being discussed this in the next 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, um, will be something of interest to you and uh, we can always follow up later. There'll be contact information at the end. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is the museum environment uh, so you can get an idea of what it was. Uh, talk about how new metrics have come about uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. 
some of the challenges that researchers have uh, and uh, uh, talk about some aspects of the project and some of the elements of new metrics, alt metrics in particular, uh, that you can uh, get uh, information from and uh, then sum it up with a little bit about the book that my chapter is in along with some other chapters that uh, some of you hopefully will find of interest to you. So, so let's do that. So the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County where I was chief librarian um, is actually a family of museums. Uh, it has a main uh, or a big site uh, where the dinosaurs are in a lot of other departments and as well as the La Brea Char Pits as well as the William S. Hart Museum, who was a silent film star back in the 20s. Um, so that's the environment in multiple physical locations around LA County. And like a lot of cultural institutions, their, their mission is typically to, to do similar to the mission of this place, which was to inspire wonder, discovery, and responsibility of our natural and cultural worlds and help us learn about things in a fun way. So um, now here are the challenges. So for the researcher specifically, and uh, you could probably relate to this no matter what environment you're in. A uh, researcher has always the challenge of demonstrating interest and visibility of their research and activity beyond uh, what traditionally we think of as um, publications with just citations. Nowadays, a lot of us are on all the different social media, online. I mean, it's, it's ubiquitous as part of our livelihood. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of discussion of research going on there as well. And uh, for the research department that somebody who's a researcher would be part of, uh, their challenge is visibility and value to the institution. Uh, you know, marketing and communications and education. And there's a lot of, of, of parts to any institution uh, and research uh, may or may not be the part, uh, but it's certainly a, a, an important part. Um, and so that's a challenge. Then the institution itself, just like any institution, the perception of its value to everybody, whoever their constituency is. And there needs to be some measurements, uh, you know, the old speeds and feeds to back up those statements and reasoning. So uh, in the academic environment, uh, it's the typical phrase is publish or perish. Uh, in museums, it's very similar. The difference is in academia, you get tenure or you don't. In museums, you don't get that. You just keep your job and keep working and keep researching and, and, and hopefully it's interesting and all that. But productivity and impact are both important. In the private sector, uh, actually research is critical. If you're in a commercial firm like a biotech, the ultimate goal is to help patients uh, stay healthy with the medicines that may be produced, but the research uh, focus is to develop those, test them, make sure they're they're okay, get patents or or get FDA approval, that kind of thing. So so there are some similarities that way, uh, and and actually uh, competitive advantage uh, plays a role because the pro of that is uh, with tools like uh, new metrics, alt metrics. Uh, you, you can understand, get a broader understanding of how people are perceiving company research out there in the world. And um, as well as understanding of what's going on at competitors and uh, other people in, in that particular arena. And, uh, and it, it, it can be really um, advantageous that way. The uh, con to that is that, uh, which is also a pro by the way, research staff are become more aware of whose research is getting more attention. So that's good, but individual researchers would say, hey, communications, how come my particular book or my particular research uh, is not getting the attention that so-and-so's is? And so I know for a fact in, in certain big research companies, uh, it's the point where tools like this are so good that uh, communications won't let the library, for instance, uh, spread the word or let staff, research staff, have full access to all that information directly because they don't want to be hassled by the ones who are not getting the attention. Interesting, right? So that's just a little side thing. Is that a big deal? Maybe, maybe not. But the other aspect, uh, which is on all metrics of any kind all the time, is researchers are very aware 
uh, of metrics as being perceived as, you know, my research is really meant for the purposes of research, not for popularity. And, and, and it's high quality and these popular numbers don't necessarily reflect the high quality of research in my little niche area. So, so that's, that's the other side of it. So, all right. So funders, and I use that term very broadly, and donors uh, are more and more wanting to know if I'm giving you money, and this is the same for bosses, you know, so if you're in a commercial firm or in a legal firm or whatever, uh, they want to see results. They want to see uh, awareness uh, in the case of of uh, public funders, societal benefits, in the case of, of commercial firms, uh, they're gonna wanna, wanna see results and, and how do you prove it? So, so there's that aspect to it. So the audience for the project that I was involved with were the researchers and their peers, uh, the granting agencies and donors where the money comes from to keep going, the administration certainly, because they pay the bills, the communications and marketing people, because in, in the experience of the project, it helped them understand, gee, what was getting attention online in, in chatter that they may or may not have already put out a press release about uh, because uh, things were not as automatic as we would like or, or would have been liked. And then another key target is certainly journalists, news outlets, bloggers uh, who are influential in getting the word out uh, to the public. And ultimately, for museums, uh, the public is the key constituency um, from an everyday standpoint. In your arena, it might be a little different. So uh, let's talk about the differences or, or how this evolved. So uh, back in around 1990, Jason Prem and some others came up with the idea of alternative metrics or alt metrics. And, and a few years, uh, it's now about nine years old, and they know that that's probably a bad word because uh, it's really not alternative, it's really uh, augmentation to the bibliometrics, which bibliometrics are uh, basically impact, you know, all of us know about journal impact factor, which is a citation ratio, and, and you know that uh, it will take, you publish an art, a published article will take a couple of years before you really see results of other people citing it, things like that. It may take months, maybe a little less these days in the online environment. Uh, once it's out, but uh, it takes a while. Whereas online attention uh, will take a matter of days or even hours, honestly, uh, or weeks or months. So there's uh, really a lot more information, a lot of more feedback on pro and con on, on research than they used to be in the more traditional ways. So that's where that came from. So how do they do this? Well, computers do it computer software and how do they do it? They love numbers or unique things. So the, the digital object identifier uh, is a unique ID and similar IDs like a PubMed ID and others are used by these systems uh, to capture the information uh, by scouring uh, the online uh, arena and, um, and pull it in from there. So that's how that's done. Uh, but these kind of tools do not indicate the quality of the publication necessarily, certainly not the quality of the researcher, and that's what their fear is, that they're gonna be judged by uh, something by numbers and not by the quality of what they're doing. And it, it's, it's not connecting all the dots, it's not the whole story. It's only one piece of the conversation. So uh, the other aspect is, uh, for those peer-reviewed publications, most have a DOI or equivalent uh, identifier, but in museums and, and maybe in your arena, the, um, the where an item is published is so esoteric or, or such niche that it's published in a society, a small society publication, that they don't have such a, a number. So these kind of systems, it's much harder. They can do it, but it's much harder to track that information. So contributions in science, what is a publication or was a publication, I should say, a peer reviewed publication of the museum. And then you have our trade publications like computers and libraries, other kinds of things like that that are out there. You know, we have the Journal of Library Administration and others that are peer reviewed, but then you have a lot of others that are not. Uh, and so those are not so easily pulled from our perspective. So a lot of disciplines have that combination problem. So uh, how do you do it? Well, for instance, I did a paper on this topic a few years ago for 
uh, the Australia New Zealand Conference Vala. And um, in and of itself, it was peer reviewed, but it doesn't have a DOI or anything like that. So I put it in Figshare as one example, just one tool for free. You can put it in there and then it assigns a DOI and then it's trackable that way. So that's one way you can do that. So that's something to think about. Uh, and uh, another way is for authors themselves to have what's called an ORCID ID. And you can look that up on ORCID.org. Uh, and, and I have done that uh, and, uh, and put in my information and they do connect to large systems so you can pull it in a lot easier. Uh, so the key about that, it's, it's, you know, my name is published as Richard P. Hulser, Richard Hulser, R. P. Hulser, R. Hulser, and that's a lot of variations right there. And so if, from a researcher standpoint, when you're trying to find a research author, uh, you have to think about all that, as you all probably already know. So this gives you a unique way to do it, and it, it is a number that you, the computer can uh, use, it's persistent, it's enduring, it improves recognition, discoverability of the research, and it's interoperable with a lot of systems. Like I, I have on the screen here, uh, something called dimensions, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And uh, there it, it allows you in the upper right, you'll see my profile where it, it you can link your ORCID information. And then in the lower middle, you'll see where it'll show that this is in your ORCID record, uh, in addition to being in your local library, um, that you have, and then you can add it, and it'll it'll indicate that you can add it if you want. Now, of course, I did not add the bottom one because that's not me; that's that's somebody else. So I'm not going to add that. But the other ones are mine, so those are a way those can be tracked. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, tools, but not a huge amount. And the ones that uh, are most uh, familiar to people out there are from a company called Altmetric, is which is what I used in this project. There's another one called Plum Analytics. Uh, Dimensions does a little of both uh, altmetric plus uh, uh, citation counting and some other stuff. And then uh, Jason Prem, who was one of the co-coiners uh, of the name altmetric, uh, has a company called Impact Story, which has a new name now, Our Research. And uh, they have some tools available as well. So uh, those are just a few. And yes, Google Analytics claims they have such things and they do have analytics but uh, I am not so sure that they truly are uh, alt metrics. Okay, that's my own opinion. Uh, I can be proven wrong. All right, so with the project. So what we did was um, we worked with the alt metric company and uh, tracked our research as an institution. Uh, and so as an individual you, a researcher, you can do your own, but you have to license uh, software typically with these companies to look at it from an institution-wide standpoint in an easy way. So we did that. And uh, so, uh, and Dr. Brian Brown, who's the researcher on the left, he's an entomologist. I got his permission to use his research in this presentation uh, to show you. And he's big on uh, flies and, and, and talks about insects and honeybees and stuff like that. And so this is his article uh, uh, in peer reviewed and other kind of scholarly publications. And uh, so we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Uh, so uh, what you can see as an institution, uh, you can see attention scores, this so-called donut as the altmetric company talks about, and uh, Plum Analytics has their own little version of that, a different version of that, that does similar things. Um, and so uh, we can look at what publications are in uh, out there and being tracked and, and that number is on in the in the donut is uh, a proprietary number. It doesn't really mean anything exactly. It's kind of a relative number uh, done by a lot of factors. You can read up on it at their website on on a little bit of how they do that. But the key to the institution was what publications uh, did the article appear in? Uh, what attention is it getting? And you'll see in the lower right uh, the timeline. Um, of uh, across the board, it covers online news, it covers Wikipedia, it covers Facebook, not likes, but cite citing of a research article where say I put a, a notice, say, hey, I read this research article, here's a link to the publisher's site uh, with the DOI, and uh, take a look at that, it'll track those kind of, of factors. And, and you can see over time, and this is an interactive timeline, and which was helpful to us, uh, to see, you know, when uh, a new uh, article came out, 
uh, how it got high attention really quick and did it maintain attention or did it, it uh, subside and then it then maybe some follow-up happened a few months later do a new discovery somebody else cited or a lot of people cited it or whatever happened and and the key about this is these are auditable what does that mean that means that you can click on the link and then uh go into uh the uh specifics on a, on a twitter and i'll tell you about that in a second so uh but let me just show you uh, here's just one example I did at one point in time, and the project was from around 2014 through 2018, uh, and uh, really 2016 to 18 was 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 when it was most robust. But uh, and remember, social media didn't uh, exist prior to around 2011, so uh, you know, getting things articles earlier than that online is uh, it's not quite the same thing. So you see back in uh, 2015 versus 2018, uh, which articles maintained high interest by people and what topics were they and which departments were they in? Those are the kinds of things you can assess with tools like this. So, uh, and also if you license things at the time, and these tools are evolving, I should tell you, just like any tool you would hope. So they may not look like this anymore. They might have much more robust, they probably do have more robust functionality, but at the time, this is what we had. So we could see uh, all the different authors in uh, the institution and, and, and see how many uh, publications they had and how many were getting attention. We could do it by department. And of course, you know, ichthyology is gonna be very different than history, which is gonna be de very different from mineral sciences because those disciplines are just so different. So, trying to look at those in a comparative way is a very dicey situation. And I think you all could relate to that in your individual environment. So, so that's, that's another con to using some of these tools, but it does give the senior execs a flavor for what's happening. And again, you can get an overall view and you can see more clearly um, in the middle to top where it, these tools cover news and blogs and Twitter and peer review of some sort, other things. I'm not sure what that means, I can't remember, but Wikipedia in particular, and those are uh, where uh, an article was cited uh, to support a particular Wikipedia um, entry and things like that. So uh, now from the researcher perspective, again, they can see all the different ones. And like, here's an example of Twitter. So they can see, gee, uh, where is my article being read? And, um, and then um, look at, uh, if they clicked on like news and the individual listed entries, they'll see the individual uh, uh, citing in, in that news or in uh, Twitter and uh, they can then click out to the specific article and see did they say something good did they say something bad uh and who are they you know and uh what's interesting is remember these days everyone wants to know how many followers people have uh and so and a follower might have a bunch of followers on their own so one person might be following but they may be a, an online journal a scientific journalist who may have five million followers okay i'll exaggerate right but uh, not quite Ellen DeGeneres, but something like that. Uh, and so that's important, they're an influencer. So a researcher would wanna know that, the institution would wanna know about that. Uh, and then you have tools like Dimensions, as I mentioned earlier. What, what people had been asking at the time we were doing this project was, what if you could combine bibliographic, bibliometrics information and um, altmetric information on the same screen? And that's what this, organization this company has done uh, in this case this is showing you just citations and you can see a more robust uh, view of citations and get some good information that way um, and as you see on the right uh, here's this honeybee article and you can see oh gee I can see the citations uh, and and get an idea of the impact factor information but I can also see the altmetrics and then click from there into those individual entries. So that's really a valuable thing there. Um, and so from our perspective, the librarian's role, what was it? Well, for me, um, amongst all my other duties, uh, project management, negotiation uh, with the vendor, with uh, individuals internally, delegating and working with the office staff who were doing uh, some of the administrative work we needed to get done, uh, relationship building, of course, 
uh, being the vendor partner or liaison throughout it and working with them on, gee, this works, this doesn't work, uh, especially when you're dealing in a beta, almost production mode at the time, uh, so that they were foibles to the project uh, product uh, that was being offered. And being the promoter or champion, and then working on educating everybody, gee, what is this? Why is it valuable? Why is it important? And uh, so more broadly, uh, the information center or the information professional is often, as we probably all know, is the canary in the coal mine, uh, where we see things that individuals in certain sectors or certain departments may not. Um, it gives us a little bit of recognition of leadership on an interesting new forward-thinking project. Uh, certainly, it provides opportunities for collaboration across the enterprise, and, and it fulfills a, a part of our mission of education, information literacy, and ultimately metric literacy, how to interpret these data. You know, uh, anything, any number requires that. And then being the embedded librarian or information professional working with those individual units. So here's an idea. It may not be for you individually, but maybe, you know, of a grad student, uh, all these companies, their main target are the scientific community. They're broadening out to the social sciences and humanities and the digital humanities communities. But what I was suggesting to them was, gee, wouldn't it be great if the peer reviewed uh, scholarly publications of the information profession were assessed using these tools? And we saw results out of that to see, well, gee, how good are they and how useful are they? So I put to you all to think about that maybe for yourself, if uh, you're in that mode of doing an interesting project or maybe a PhD or master's candidate who wants a project, I think this could be very interesting. And you'd have to work with those individual vendors. Um, they, uh, they were interested in the idea, but it wasn't their key focus. But I think we need to take that initiative and make it happen. Sometimes it just takes us to push our, our own vendors to do these things. So uh, what I've described in this really quick 20 minutes is uh, my uh, a little over a bit of an overview of what Altmetrics is in the book chapter uh, in the new metrics edited by Elaine Last out of the University of Albany um, is a more detail of of the time and you can read that and uh, and see there are other uh, chapters uh, from NCAR the out of Denver Boulder area uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research the EPA. Michigan Publishing, so you have a publisher there, and then the Institute for Transportation Studies out of Berkeley, uh, and uh, quite a variety. And, and, and if you get the PDF of this presentation uh, in the after part, uh, after my thank you screen, are a few more pages, or a few more screens of um, what uh, were similar to all of us and what were very different from each of us, because each of us are very different environments. So you can look at that there. But here's, and here's some links to some of these companies and organizations, and you can get more information that way. And so with that, uh, I'm, I've, we've got a few minutes and I wanna thank you and I'll turn it over to Michael for questions. Perfect, thank you so much. It's really interesting. Really appreciate your uh, insight there. But we do have a couple of questions that have, have come through, um, but if anybody would also like to submit their own now, is the time to do so um, via that, um, menu screen on your on your go to webinar interface there so the first one that's come through richard is um are alt metrics a replacement for bibliometrics uh great question uh no no in fact uh that's why uh, uh i was at uh, the uh international alt metrics conferences uh in europe uh and in canada the past mm. couple of years and that was a big discussion point because uh, they feel that the name alt metrics is really a misnomer. And that's why Elaine uh, wanted to call it the new metrics, because it's really uh, an augmentation or additional uh, piece to um, what we consider, you know, the journal impact factor or bibliometrics. Uh, so that uh, we're really understanding uh, more about the online discussions of research that journal, printed journals, or even digital journals just with citations, you're not gonna quite get, you're gonna get a little bit of that, but not a, a lot of it. So it's really, uh, as I said earlier, it's uh, not the whole story, it's a piece of the puzzle. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, um, what, what do the publishers think about Altmetrics? Uh, you know, that's really interesting. Um, 
publishers, uh, this is my, my assessment, and I've talked to a few, uh, they think it's really useful. And so they actually uh, promote uh, these tools. And you'll, if you go to a journal uh, uh, landing page or a particular article, you'll see often uh, either the Altmetric Donut or the Plum Analytics uh, badge or something similar on the page because it helps, just like the journal impact factor, uh, a lot of the, you know, the JAMA and some of the other big journals um, would promote, oh, we have an impact, you know, science uh, magazine, science journal has an impact factor of whatever it is, 35 or whatever it is, uh, you know, and they promote that. So they promote these badges by interacting uh, or having those on there and uh, and providing links to not only their own analytics, but also to these these as well. So they actually, uh, by the fact that they're using them, so many of them are using them and putting them on their own sites. Um, they must have deals with these companies, obviously, to do it. Uh, and there are ways to do that on your institutional repository, by the way. So check with the vendors on that um, for those that you get posted there. But uh, they seem to like it. So that tells me it's got credibility. And that's important mm -hmm. because it's not just a new 